I never used to drink wine. Oh, it was our Melandra who started me on it. She said to me once, she said, Mother, Mother, nobody drinks rum and coke these days. Everybody drinks wine. Mother, have a glass of rising instead. Kids, they think they know everything, don't they? Melandra was going through a slightly intellectual phase at the time. You know, <laughs> her and her mate, Sharon Louise, because it was all white wine and Bruce Springsteen in those days. They stopped going down to clubs in town and started going to that um, bistro all the time, you know, where the poets and artists sang out. They met, uh, what's his name one night? Uh, Henry Adrian, that's right. Apparently, Sharon Louise got his autograph on breakfast as well, I believe. <laughs> anyway, they're out of that phase now, and am I glad, because the pair of them would sit here at the table, and all you'd hear out of them was, it was great, it was great, was a laugh. And then they'd go back in trance for half an hour, and then, and then suddenly you'd hear, it was brilliant last night, it was more than brilliant, it was mega brilliant, it was, it was double fab. And you know, no matter how long they sat here, you'd never find out what it was that was so mega brilliant and double fab. Maybe it was the breakfasts. <laughs> Mind ya, I do miss them, the kids. Melandra is sharing a flat with, with Sharon Louise now, and our Brian is living in a squat in Kirkby. I said to him, I said, Brian, son, if you're going to live in a squat, couldn't you pick some place nice? You know, some place like Chilwall. And he said, Mother, Mother, Chilwall is no place for a poet. Could you see, that's our Brian's latest scheme. He's going to be Britain's first ever busker poet. And what's he like, Wall? The language. I hate the fucking daffodils. I hate the blue remembered hills. He's loop de loop. <laughs> Mind you, I'm glad he's given up archery. <laughs> oh God, look at the time. What am I doing? Sitting here talking, and he'll be in for his tea soon. And uh, what's he like? Whoa, what's he like, my fella? Well. He likes everything to be as it's always been. Like his tea always has to be on the table as he walks through that door. If the plate is not land on the table as his foot is land on the map, there's ruction. There's no use arguing. I, I said to him once, I said, Joe, if your tea is not on the table at the same time every night, it does not mean, Joe, that the pound has collapsed or that there has been a world disaster. It only means, Joe, that, that one of the billions of human beings on this planet has to have his tea at a different time. <laughs> Did it do any good? I could have been talking to that, couldn't I, Wall? I could have been talking to you. <laughs> oh, I said I'd leave him when the kids grew up. Oh, by the time the kids grew up, there was no place to go. <laughs> but I mean, you don't start again at 42, do you? Uh, they, say, don't they? They, they say that when you reach your 40s, life gets to be a bit jaded, uh, and you start to believe that all the good things are things in the past. I must have been an early developer. I felt that way at 25. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying he's bad, my fella. He's just no bleeding good. <laughs> they're all the same, aren't they? I mean, they're lovely at first, you know, when they're courting you, before you've had the horizontal party with them. <laughs> they're marvellous then. They'll do anything for you. Nothing is too much trouble. But the minute, the very minute after they first had you, their behaviour begins to change. It's like that advert, isn't it? I was watching it the other night, you know, Cadbury's Milk Train Man. Oh, he's marvelous. You, you see him, he, he dives off a thousand foot cliff and he swims through two miles of water just to drop off a box of Cadbury's chocolates. <laughs> and you discover from this that the lady loves milk tray and that she's kept her legs firmly closed. 
it's back. Tomorrow there's plenty of people she can find to go with. I mean, I, I tried to take in the bloody tickets offer in the first place. But, well, I tried to tell her, to explain, to tell her that it were impossible. But you know how feminists are. If something's impossible, it's the perfect reason for doing it. <laughs>
sounds like a name, doesn't it? Clitoris. Hiya, Clitoris. How are you? You know, Clitoris, I was wondering, when we go sh shut up, Walt, well, why not? I think it sounds nice. I mean, there's plenty of men walking around called Dick. you 
have to find a lonely cattle shed and stay there for the night, and then he's supposed to go off, you know, pulling the donkey and the Virgin Mary after him. But he didn't.
up. What up? Grease is just something to cook his eggs and chips in. Ah, they. Another bottle of Ryzen. I'll be able to pretend that this is Grease. A eh, wall. Whoa, look out there. Oh, can you see the sea? The sea everywhere. Look at the sun shining. Can you smell that honeysuckle? Taste the olives, the grapes. Whoa, look, look at that lady, that lovely lady, sitting there all serene at a table by the sea, drinking wine in a country where the grape is grown. Of course, 
question of the preacher doesn't answer it. <laughs> he never does, you know, so he has to answer himself and he says, I'll tell you what she's given me. She's given me chips on egg. She's given me chips on fucking egg. Well, I don't know what possessed me, but I got up from the chair and I, and I cleaned myself down as best I could. I came over here, I got the pen and then I, I wrote on the wall in big letters, Grease. He didn't even notice. <laughs> he was too busy giving the cooker and the fridge his impression of Arthur Scargill delivering the Gettysburg address. So I, I just I just grabbed a light coat and I, I went out. I, I walked around to the Landris flat, but uh, she wasn't in. And so I, I walked around the block a few times and then I tried to phone Jane, but the phones were out of order. Well, they always are, aren't they? Well, they are around here. Even the vandals are complaining. So anyway, I, just had, I, I walked around for about an hour. I wanted to see someone and talk to someone, but um, there wasn't anyone. Where's everyone gone to? I mean, I, I never felt so alone in my entire life. I used to know so many people. So, so I just, I, I came back here, you know, and, and, and Joe had been to the Chinese takeaway, and, and when I came in, he said, pointing at the wall, what's that? I said, it's a place, it's a place I'm going to. And he said, I'm not going to do Greece. If that's why I'm not getting fed proper, because you're saving up for some foreign holiday, you can forget it. And that's when I started laughing. I ended up, well, I was hysterical, really. I, I ended up uh, rolling on the floor. I was laughing so hard. And well, he just uh, stepped over me and uh, <laughs> he walked out. And I was laughing so hard because, well, well, see, I knew then. I knew I was going to do it. I knew I was going to go. Greece. And it all worked out marvelous, didn't it? I mean, I made all the arrangements. I, I got my passport. I was really very impressed with myself. So, so yesterday I thought, you know, I'd, I'd nip into town to get a few last minute things. You, you know, the way you do. So as I was walking past Marks and Spencer, I saw this lovely lingerie display in the window. I mean, dead, silky, a little bit Janet Breger, but it, it asked the price, you know. Well, I, usually I'm a bit conservative, you know, next to the skin, but, but I thought to myself, oh, Shirley, give yourself a treat. Those things will be nice and cool in a hot climate. So I go in and, and I buy a, a couple of bras and a, and, a, and a couple of slips and a few pair of panties, and as I'm getting them wrapped up at the counter, who should come over but her from next door? Jillian. Now, what's Jillian like, Wall? Well, let's see, what's Jillian like? I'm not saying she's a bragger, but if you've been to paradise, she's got a season ticket. <laughs> she's that type, you know, if you've got a headache, she's got a brain tumor. So, anyway, she comes over and she says, oh, hello, Shirley. Because that's the way she talks, you know, like she begrudges you the breath. Oh, hello, Shirley. And as she spots my little garments, she says, oh, these are nice. And she's picking up one of my slips, you know, and having a real good gop at it. It's marvelous what they can do these days with man-made fibers. And I'm saying to myself, Shirley, keep your mouth shut. There's no winning with her, you know. And then she, was, and then she said, um, you'd almost think it was silk if you were not familiar with the real thing. She drops it down on the counter and then she says, but I think they will look quite nice on your Melandra. Well, I couldn't keep my mouth shut, you know. That really got me riled. So, so I heard myself saying, oh, no, Gillian, these are not for Melandra. These are for myself. But I shan't be wearing them for myself alone. I shall be wearing them for me lover. <laughs> well, her jaw dropped into her handbag for once she couldn't top it, and, and then I got a little bit carried away. And I, and I heard myself saying, uh, oh yes, Judy and me lover and I, we leave tomorrow for a fortnight in the Greek islands. Two weeks of sun, sun, caramus, a lot, and whatever else suits our fancy. Oh, I, I must be off, Judy, there's still a few more things I must buy. Oh, you didn't happen to notice which counter the garter belts were on, did you? Oh, never mind, I'll 
halfway to Australia and she's saying, Mother, will you make me the cocoa and toast like you used to? And she's up the stairs to her room. Well, I make her the cocoa and the toast and I take it up to her and she's got herself in bed, you know, uh, propped up with two pillows and she's reading her old Beano annuals. And she's saying, oh, I love you, Mother. I don't know what made me live with that cow in the first place. Mother, there's not enough sugar in this cocoa. Would you go downstairs and get me a spoon? So, I go downstairs, I get the sugar, I bring it up, I stir it in for her, and she's saying, Mother, we'll go downtown on Saturday, shall we? Hey, Mother, just the two of us and do some shopping? Okay, Mother. And you know what? I'm nodding. Well, she hasn't been on for ten minutes, and I've turned into Otto, Mother. I mean, she's got me <laughs> strutting around like R2 bleeding D2. <laughs> it was when she asked me to go downstairs and bring the TV upstairs to her that uh, my head cleared. So instead of going downstairs, I sat down at the edge of her bed, and I said, um, Blanca, I'm real pleased you come home, because I missed you. And I never say that, you know, I don't whinge and whine, because I think you kids, you have to have your own lives. But you know, there's many a time I would have loved to have sat down and had a chat with you, gone into town and done some shopping with you. I mean, not as your mother, mind you, but just as another human being. But, but I couldn't, you know, because you have your own life, your own friends, your own interests. None of that to do with me. Well, we'll do it now, Mother, because I've come home. And oh, that's fantastic, I said. And you couldn't have picked a better time for it. It'll be a great help having you here to look after your father. <laughs> Should have seen the look on her face. <laughs> Why? What's the matter with him? <laughs> oh, nothing, I assured her. But, you know, with me not being here, with me and Jane going to Greece tomorrow, it's like a hot water bottle had sprung a leak. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm going to Greece for a fortnight. You going to Greece? What for? For two weeks, I said. Well, she's flouncing out of there, and she said, you and that Jane were going to Greece. What has my father had to say about that? Well, when I told her I hadn't told him, she went mental, and now she's getting dressed, and she is saying, I think it's a disgrace. Two middle-aged women going to Greece. I think it's disgusting. And she's down the stairs on the phone to Sharon Louise, calling her, telling her that she's coming back to the flat. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
be like, of not knowing what the foreign language would be like, of not knowing for more years than I care to remember exactly what each day held in store for me. The, the, the excitement of something that was foreign to me. The excitement of jumping off our roof. And Mama Landry said that it was like she caught me just as I was about to jump in. And she said, hey, what are you doing up there? Don't be so bloody stupid, you'll break your stupid neck. And I hesitated and looked down and, and saw how big the drop was and how hard the ground was and how fragile my bones were. And I realized I was too old for jumping off roofs. So I, I went downstairs to phone Jane, you know, and then called my mother and tell her she needed to come in for the fortnight. I'd even picked up the phone when the back doorbell went and I, I wanted to get it and it was Jillian, you know, from next door. And, and she... She said, hello, Shirley, I just wanted to know if Joe was here. And I laughed and I said, no, Jillian, but if you've come to spill the beans, you might as well. She said, no, I have no beans to spill. I just wanted to know if Joe was at home before I gave you this. And she handed me this beautifully wrapped package. And she said, I want you to have this, Shirley. You see, it's never been worn. I was never brave enough. Oh, I wish I had, I wish I'd had your bravery. Uh, uh, and then she went to go and she turned back at the door and she said, I want you to know I think you're brave, Shirley. I think you're marvelous. Uh, and she went out. And I opened up that package. And it was this. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's silk. Jillian is right. There's nothing like the real thing. <laughs> she must have bought it years and years ago. Because look, it still has the original label on it. Well, I, I, I didn't want to try it on at first. And I felt awful about what I said to her about me taking a lover and all that. I mean, I never thought she believed me. But she had completely believed me. She thought it was perfectly possible for me to be this brave, marvelous, living woman. I, I, I took my mirror out to try to see what it was that Jillian had seen in me because, because in, in Jillian's eyes I was no longer Shirley, the next door neighbor, Shirley, the middle-aged mother, Shirley Bradshaw. I had become Shirley the brave, Shirley the sensational, Shirley Valentine. And, and even though I, I couldn't see it in the mirror, even if none of it was true about me taking a lover and all that other rubbish, the point of the matter is that she had believed it. She had completely believed it. So, I tried on the robe. Oh. It was perfect. It was beautiful. And in that moment, so was I. <laughs> in that moment, our roof wouldn't have been tall enough for me. I could have jumped off a skyscraper. So, so, the day's here. And, 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 I, and I'm going to that place on the other side of the wall. I, I'm, I'm going to eat olives on, on a Greek seafront. I don't even like olives. <laughs> but, but maybe I will in Greece. They have squid there, you know, they do. And octopus, I'm going to eat it too, I don't care. I'm going to try everything. I'm going to do anything like I used to. Unafraid, without fear, I'll be Shelly the Brave. Of course, I'm terrified, really, but I'm not going to let that stop me from enjoying myself. I, I can't be a girl again. I mean, you could never be that. But instead of saying, oh, Christ, Shirley, you're 
James, come on with a taxi at four o'clock. Twenty past two. <laughs> Yeah.
watch the Olympic Games, don't you? Ah, did you know it was the Greeks who invented the Olympic Games? Well, everyone's staring at me. Oh, yeah. The Greeks are responsible for so many things. As a matter of fact, it was the Greeks who were responsible for the most important invention of all. The wheel. I don't know if it was the Greeks or the Irish or the cavemen who invented the wheel. It didn't matter. Once I started, there was no stopping me. The English, I said, don't talk to me about the English because whilst the Greeks were building roads and cities and temples, what were the English doing? I'll tell you what the English were doing. The English were running around in loincloths, plowing up the earth with the arse bone of a giraffe. I hadn't meant to get so carried away. I didn't realize how loud I'd been shouting. The entire restaurant is looking at me. And the man and his family at the next table have turned back away. And Dougie and Jeanette are wondering who the unichick was they had invited to their table. So finally, uh, Dougie decides to use diversionary tactics. So he calls out to the waiter who's just walking away. Mate! Mate, excuse me. And he's pointing down at his plate. Um, what's this? It is calamari's, sir. Yeah, but what I'm asking you is, what is it? <laughs> it is calamari, sir. It is type of fish. Dougie's not convinced. <coughs> Doesn't look much like fish to me. My wife has a very delicate stomach. She's got to be very particular about what she eats. Are you sure this is fish? Yes, sir. Fish. Pulled from sea this morning. From father's boat. Boat called Noah. <laughs> <laughs> the silence at our table was deafening. Everyone was just eating and no one saying a word. And I'm feeling like a right heel because I've upset them all. You know, I'm, I'm trying to find the right thing to say that will make it all right. And you know when there's a kind of silence and kind of force yourself to find the right words. You never quite come out with the right thing, do you? But what I came up with was, uh, squid's very nice, isn't it? <laughs> Doogie and Jeanette stopped eating, and Jeanette looked at me and said, pardon me? Yeah, I said, squid, the point at her plate. The octopus, quite nice, isn't it? Funny the way Jeanette fainted. <laughs>
man full of shit. <laughs>
got lost in all this unused life. Ah, that's what I was thinking. Sitting there staring out at the sea, my eyes open wide, tears splashing down from them. I, I must have sat there a long time because the, because the noise from the hotel bar had died away and, and, the, and the fella from the taverna was clearing up for the night and he came out to collect my glass. It was still full. I hadn't even taken a sip and he, he'd seen that I'd been crying. He didn't say anything. He sat down in the sand and he stared out at the sea. And, and then when I, I was all right, you know, when it was okay to talk, he, he said, he said to me, he said, dreams are never in place. You expect them to be. And I smiled. And then he said, come, I escort you back to your hotel. And I, and I said, okay. And he told me that uh, his name was Costas, and I told him my name was Shirley. And, and then he said that we were at the front of the hotel, the door to the hotel. He turned to me and he said, you won't, you won't come with me tomorrow. We take brother's boat, we go all around the island. You've been dead kind as it is, really. He's no problem. Tomorrow I come for you early. No, really. You afraid? He suddenly said. No. You afraid? He said. You afraid? I won't try to make fuck with you. <laughs> I didn't know where to put myself. But, 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 uh, he just laughed and he said, Of course I won't try to make fuck with you. You lovely woman. Honey man, me crazy not to want to make fuck with you. But I don't ask folk, I ask the one brother's folk. It's different thing. Folk is folk, folk is folk. <laughs> I come for you early, he said. I put food and wine on folk. Tomorrow I just make you happy. No be sad, no be afraid. Tomorrow I promise I give you my word of honor. I don't try and make folk with you. <laughs> well, what could I say? <laughs>
someone who likes you, you know, approves of you, you start to grow again. You, you walk in the right way, you just say the right thing at the right time. And, and you're not uh, 16 or 42 or 64, you're just, you're, just, you're, just, you're just alive. And I know that if I could have seen myself that day, I would have said, look at that lovely <coughs> lady sailing on the sea. Look at that lovely lady swimming. Yeah, well, I know I left my swimming costume back at the hotel, so what? Uh, we, we parked the boat in this little cove, you know, and I, and I was looking over the side, and I said to Costas, um, how deep do you think it is, Costas? And he said, oh, 1,000 meters, maybe 10,000 meters, maybe it goes on forever. And as I stood on the edge of the boat, as naked as the day I was born about to jump into water that was as deep as forever. I felt as strong and as excited and as bloody mad as I did when I jumped off our roof. We swam and splashed and laughed. And I knew that Costas would keep his promise to me. But I didn't want him to, because it was the most natural thing in the world. So I swam over to him and kissed him. That's when I nicknamed him Christopher Columbus. <laughs> Mind you, I could have just as well called him Andre Brevin. I didn't know where that orchestra came from. <laughs> Later on, you know, lying on the deck of the boat with the sun, beginning to dip towards evening, this thought came into my head. I, I, I tried to push it out because it was such a shocking thought, but it just kept coming back into my head. I, I tried to put other thoughts in there to keep that thought away, but it, it just kept coming back. Uh, and that thought was, if somehow, if for some reason, I don't go back home, who would really care? Would it cause any suffering? Would it cause any real damage? Who would miss me? Why should I go back? Why should I go back home and become that woman when that woman's job is done? She's brought up her kids. Oh, I, I, I know the kids would say it was terrible. They had a mother who went on holiday and never came back.
life. So, I'm, I'm standing there at the airline counter and my bag's on the conveyor belt, you know, with tags on it, for England, for home, and I'm seeing it go down the conveyor belt and, and through those flaps and disappears into the dark hole. And I knew then, I knew I couldn't go with it. Jane called out at me as she saw me walking away and then she knew, she realized, she yelled at me to come back, come back, and I knew everybody in the queue wanted me to come back, come back, but I just kept on walking down the concourse. Now, honestly, all I had on me was the clothes I, I stood up in, um, Jillian's row, my handbag, um, the passport, and, uh, and a few drachmas, and after the bus ride, even the drachmas were gone. And as I got up to Costas' taverna, I saw him in a bar stool talking to a woman. <coughs> And I heard him say, um, you're afraid, you're afraid I won't try to make fuck with you. <laughs> Poor fellow, when he saw me, he almost dropped his olives. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, Costas, don't worry. I didn't come back for you. I came back for the job. The job in your taverna. Three weeks I've been working there now. I don't ask it on well with the customers. Even the Dougies and Jeanettes, we get a pair of them every week, you know. I see them, they're sitting there and they've ordered a drink and they're studying their menu with this quizzical look on their face, you know, and I, I go up to them then and I say, uh, you want me to do your eggs and chips? Oh, they're made up then. Being a part of it, you're a proper part of it. It's much better than being on a holiday. I get uh, most of the days off. And I only work nights, but, uh, well, I've got tonight off, though, because, well, because Joe's arriving tonight. Oh, yeah, Joe. yeah. First time he, he phoned me after Jane got back, he screamed at me, and he said that I was a disgrace, that I had finally gone mad. I was a disgrace to him and to the kids and to myself. It was the easiest thing in the world to put the phone down on him. <laughs> Second time he phoned me, he said, you can't run away from life. And I said, that's right, Joe. And now that I've found some life, I have no intention of running away from life. <laughs> well, he started screaming and shouting again and said he knew all about the holiday romance and how I'd made a fool of myself. And if I would just quit arson around and get myself on a plane and get myself home where I belong, he promised, he promised, he promised never to mention it. And I said to him, Joe, Joe, the only holiday romance I've had is with myself, really. And, and Joe, you know, I think I've, I've come to life myself. I think I'm okay. I think if I saw myself, I'd say, that woman's all right. She's alive. I mean, she's not remarkable. She's not going to be in any history books, but, but she's there in the time she's living in. And, and, and sure, she's got her wounds and her battle scars, but maybe some of the bullshit is true and, and the wound shouldn't be hidden away because the wounds and the scars mean that she's alive. Well, there was this dead silence. I thought he'd gone off the phone and then I heard him say, I knew it, I knew it, it's the bleeding change of life, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, that's right, Joe, it's a change of life and that's why you're wasting your money phoning me to get me to come back. I'm not coming back. Third time he phoned, he told me that um, Brian had been arrested for busking without a license and, and that our Melandra was fretting for me and that he loved me and that the only thing he wanted in the whole world was for me to come back. And I just told him it was impossible because the woman that he wanted to come back didn't exist anymore. Then I got a letter from him. Said he was coming here, he was coming to take me back home. God love him. He must have been watching Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be here soon. I hope he stays for a while. He needs a holiday. He needs to feel the sun on his skin and the swim in water that's as deep as forever and to have his wet head kissed. He needs to stare out at the sea and to understand. I asked Costas to move the table and chair over here by the edge of the sea again and he said, you look for dream again. I said, no, no dream Costas, but but I want to be 
sitting here when Joe arrives and as he walks down the esplanade and walks right past me because he doesn't recognize me, I want to call out to him and as he turns back to me with this quizzical look on his face, I, I want to say to him, hello, I used to be the mother, I used to be the wife. Now I'm Shirley Valentine again. Would you like to join me for